I'm just going to introduce you. Most of you know who he is. Guy that's been uh, a great help to me and a great help to the group and the Justice on Emily Lewis campaign. We have the legend who is the one and only Guy Taylor. Well, how do I uh, follow that? Right. Um, listen, this is getting easier for me, right? I've been doing this for many years and it's getting easier and seeing you guys here now, it's, just, it's amazing because the reason it's getting easier is because more and more people are waking up and I don't have to start this by saying, guess what, you know, do you know what common law is? You, you, you've all, we all know why you were here, don't we? Yeah. yeah? We all know why we're here, yeah? So hopefully I can give you a little bit more insight to, to what's going on. Um, and, and we'll go through what's going on, but, you know, applaud yourselves, because, I mean, the fact that I'm down here in Port Talbot with you, with you guys here, awesome. You know, three years ago, everyone had me with a tinfoil hat on, you know what I mean? And, and everyone's waking up, and, you know, it's awesome that you guys are here, so uh, applaud, applaud yourselves, please, right? Hey. Obviously, what, you know, what, what's been going on over the years is that a lot of us, we're, we're taught, we stood on the shoulders of giants, right? And we, we were taught about common law, and common law is completely different to statute law. And so um, we, we understood that, you know, these guys are doing something wrong. And you know, it's morally wrong if people are evicting you, or, or you know, never mind constitutionally wrong, but we had no redress because they kept coming up with statute law and it, we, we didn't know what was going on. Now, you know, we've started investigating their paperwork because ultimately they're coming at us. So we know it's morally wrong. We know it's constitutionally wrong. But okay, well, let's examine your paperwork then. Let's make sure it's correct to the prescribed form because the whole thing about statute law, it has to be to a prescribed form. And that's where they come unstuck because they're lazy. They don't do their jobs. They don't cross the T's, they don't dot the I's. So we've got them, you know, we've got them nailed on. Yeah. Now we've had this thing going on, I mean, we've picked specifically on, has this got feedback or? Okay, we, we, we picked specifically on evictions, because it's terrorism. You know, let's get absolutely right. They might know about, say, say some soldier gets killed in the street today by some terrorist, right? Well, what about the people getting kicked out of their homes with their kids and, and, and all that? that? Surely, yeah? On fraudulent documentation, that's terrorism. You know, let's get it absolutely right. What is terrorism? So that's why well, a few weeks ago, myself and uh, Mark Salon and um, Mr. Eber and that rang the rang MI5, you know, and, and put it to them and uh, said, I don't know who's seen or hasn't seen that, MI5 aren't interested in terrorism. They're, they're the paedophile protection squad, as far as I can see. And I'm absolutely <laughs> right. But they, they advised us to go to the police, so we... All of us got in a minibus, and of course, we were at the local golf club. We were from all over Britain, and we went down to the local police station, which I'm sure Mark Sloan will release a film of, because we filmed and recorded everything. We were transparent, didn't we? We ain't got anything like And we all went down to the police station, so when the minibus pulled up, I went to the counter, and of course, a big crowd of people came in with me, and I said, we've been sent down here by MI5. <laughs> <laughs> which we had. So they, they all start running around like endless chickens, and... Um, we got two really good coppers took us into a room. One was a detective constable, one was a PC. And uh, we said, look, we've got fraudulent documents. We've got this, we've got that. And, we were, and they were really good. And they didn't know they were being recorded and filmed. And we went through it with them for five hours. But we went through it knowing that ultimately, someone farther up the food chain, you know, some uh, chief inspector with a shiny baton, you know, a little cap, is uh, some mason or whatever, is going to pull the plug on it. But we went through the process. And that's the point, going through the process, going through the protocol. Yeah, going through the protocols. That's, that's the point, yeah? So, what's been happening in the last few months, which has changed things dramatically, is the response. And we've got Francis here from Response down here, and uh, AD and that from the Midlands set up the response. And, of course, guys like Francis have done it down here. And it's awesome, because it means that we're we're able to get a group of people to stop an eviction anywhere in the UK, really. I mean, in some areas we're in light, yeah? In some areas we're heavy, but we're able to do that. And the thing is, with the boots on the ground, it's, it's a common law action. 
So the fact that you, they're not physically able to enforce their statutory mechanism, that they have to go away. And when they go away, what they do is they have to do a risk assessment. Because when they came there, they were there expecting to take possession of a property, which they, a hundred people end up turning up, they can't do it. So they have to go and take a risk assessment. So great, we stop it on that day, but ultimately, six o'clock in the morning the next day, they can come back and crash their way through. Still with fraudulent paperwork. But that's the whole idea of what we're doing. We're stopping it physically, and then we're examining their paperwork and scrutinizing their paperwork to make sure it's to the prescribed form. Because abuse of the statutory process is a common law offence. So that's, that's really the key of all this. And it took me years to get my head around that simple statement, right, which we tried to come out with. But it really is a powerful tool because they're enforcing games rules and a mechanism upon us. So all the T's must be crossed, the I's must be dotted. That's why they're paid hundreds of pounds an hour, solicitors, to cross the T's and dot the I's. And of course, when you, you'll always find abuse of process, right? And because they've been, they went, to, they went to university and they thought to themselves, well, I've done my, my, my bit. I'll put, me, I'll put me law books up on the shelf. Don't need to bother them anymore. I've got a rubber stamping clown called a judge in the court. He's going to rubber stamp away all day. And job's done. And this is what's going on. And, and the deeper you go down the rabbit hole, the worse and worse it gets. I mean, I, I, I'll just say this as an offshoot. I heard the other day of someone who went to Burger King up in Manchester, and they got stitched up with a couple of bags of chips. So what they did, rather than go back to Burger King, they checked out the VAT receipt number and found out that they weren't Burger King at all. They were some offshore company operating from the, the Virgin Islands. So I mean, the, where does this all go? You know, I mean, it, it, it's beyond. So anyway, right. So what, you know, Linda is the puppet master, so I'm just here, you know, with the strings attached. What I want to tell you about is, is basically, I've said about response, I've said about CPS, they're the Crown Prosecution Service, or, or the Corporation Protection Service. Because what actually happens, I take out private criminal prosecutions against these people. Yeah, there. Is that better? Yes. Can you all hear that? Yes. Okay, yeah, it's just one little thing to spell me, right? So I, I take private criminal prosecutions out against uh, these characters. Because ultimately, if they're coming around to you, like um, bailiffs or whatever, they have to have a statutory instrument. And it has to be to the prescribed form. If it isn't, then obviously everything they do is unlawful. Because they're actors, and they're acting in their acting capacity. And if you're acting in your acting capacity, you have to operate inside the boundaries afforded you by the legislation attached to that role. So, in simple terms, it just means you can't step outside the box. If you do, you can never be, you can never, they can never legislate for someone to break the law. And they can never indemnify someone, insure someone, to break the law. So if they, they operate inside the boundaries afforded them by, by the legislation, fine, but most of them don't. And it's very, very easy to, to pull them apart. Because what's happened over a period, long period of time is there's developed a culture. And like I've said, where the solicitors have been to university and they uh, they don't need to put same books down, you know, they know what goes on in there and all that the way it is. Standard procedure. When you hear a standard procedure, you know you've got them. Because standard procedure, in any prescribed form, and I, I, I use a simple analogy, if a couple of us went to work in a factory with all you guys in there, and the boss told me and Linda to do a job a certain way, and we started doing a job a certain way, and then after a bit of time, you lot walk over and goes, what are you two doing? You're going to get us in a lot of trouble, don't you? Nah, do this. We start doing it the way you say what the shop floor say. And very soon we're training people to do the same thing. And that's the culture, and that's what's been going on. And, and it, it's easy to expose, because luckily we've got redress to the culture at every stage, under their own rules, under their own civil procedure rules, if we're dealing inside the county court. Which I'll explain to you. Right. Yeah, do I need it? I'm loud enough. I'm loud enough. 
Right, so act, actors and, and acting, right? Okay, so you've got actors and acting. This is what you've got on every case, right? Okay, you've got a traffic warden, wakes up in the morning, in a traffic warden, he puts on his little uniform and he's a traffic warden. You judge the judge, anyone who's acting, it's an actor, and acting in that capacity. So, but they've got to operate inside those boundaries afforded them by legislation. So, a traffic warden couldn't walk out, bang on your door, write out a warrant, and come and do a drug search on your house. Whoa, you're, you're a traffic warden, mate, you can't do that. You'd be operating outside the boundaries afforded you by legislation attached to your acting role. So you've got to stay inside your box. <coughs> no, you don't. No, it's all right. It's all right. No, no, it's all right. Yeah, okay. That's okay. 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 Sorry about that. Yeah. It's the boss. He's always... So, so they've got to operate inside their own games rules. Now, that includes judges. Now, you know, judges don't wake up in the morning and they're a judge full on. You know I mean? I, they could go down a local pub and get drunk and decide that, you know, Man United are going to beat Barcelona 10 nil, you know, and that's a judgment, you know. It, it just, it, it, they could do, and they probably would do if they had the chance, but, you know, they, they can't because it, they're operating outside the boundaries of formal legislation and they haven't got the subject matter of jurisdiction. Now, all these words I'm saying, I'm not, they're not complicated words when you join them together and just go and find out. So, subject matter of jurisdiction. Just find out what it is. It means that the, the, to have the jurisdiction to deal with that specific subject matter. And then when you're just standing... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's it. it I mean, look, everything I'm saying ain't complicated. It isn't complicated. It's only that I've had too much time on my hands to learn this stuff. You know what I mean? The whole thing for that hole is getting for them, isn't it? Every time... Listen, and this is what exactly right. Because what happens is this. And Mr. Ebert says, right, every time they come and they, they knock you back in court or whatever, God. Well, to be honest, what the hell did you expect? <laughs> did you expect to get a gold medal? You know, everyone's going for the Easter egg hunt. You know, expecting to say a specific word or, oh, if you say that sentence, you look. You're dealing with criminals. You're dealing with criminals and cowards. That's what they are. That's, there's no in betweens. The ones who look in the eye are criminals, and the ones who look away are the cowards. No in betweens. And don't expect them. Don't expect to win inside the, inside that arena. You might get a stalemate. So you might get, oh, well, we'll reserve judgment for a couple of weeks while we go away and talk to some of our bigger mates. But they're cap you've got capos, and each time you've got a capo judge. And he'll be the one that holds things inside that area, right? Um, and we, we had, I was in that when we had Vosper in, in the court, and I said I'd arrest him and he run out of the court, yeah? I mean, but this is what they are. They're, they're the, the area capos. Maybe some of the other judges don't agree with it, but they're too cowardly to do anything about it. That's the point, yeah? And we've got that in every, every part of this country. We've got that, yeah? I mean, Operation Tiberius, the Freemasons, all that. In the day, we're just dealing with criminals. You know, we don't need to get involved. Psychopaths. You know, psychopaths is what we're dealing with. And it's easily provable. And the, and the reason I started, you know, I started off doing the common law trail, which is correct, but when you go into a magistrate's court fighting house bridge, or discuss, trying to discuss Hansards, it goes straight over their head, yeah? And they just rubber stamp away. So, I, you know, as, as I've described before, it's taking a backgammon board to a chess match. So when Mr. Ebert got me involved in the, in the forensic examination of, of court documentation, then I could say, hang on, you're taking them part in their own game. Because there are essential key ingredients to set off a claim against you. If you haven't broken the law, so you, you, you know, you're not guilty of harm, injury, loss, or fraud in your contracts, then they take you to a civil court, yeah, and for a civil action, right? Well, that's all fair and well, but to set that civil action in motion, every single civil action has to have key ingredients. And those key ingredients are this. You walk into the court and you get an application or a claim form, we'll get it offline. You fill that claim application form out. You have to support that with an affidavit or a statement of truth. And then you have to pay a fee or get a fee remission if you're on the street. But that's what you have to do. So we advise everybody who's had a court case, doesn't matter if, however long ago it was, solicitors are obligated to keep files for seven years in archives. So if you've got a problem, go and ask under CPR, and again, spouting their rules, it's just because they deal in a codified language, so we apply their codes to them. And you go down with one piece of paper, 
and you say, I want access to my court files within 48 hours under CPR 542. The courts are obligated to give you access to your court file. Yeah. If you're lucky. Well, okay, we, yeah. But that's the rule. But the point is, if people um, aren't abiding by their own rules, it's holding the mirror up to them. And people don't like what they see. Yeah? If, if you're holding the mirror up to them and saying, well, excuse me, this is what you're supposed to be doing and you're not doing it, the game changes and people start waking up. Because anyone can go for anything and go and ask for their file. And when you go there, you discover something very, very interesting. Because what's been happening all over this country since the year of DOT, right, is this. When you go into a county or civil court, you walk through the doors. It might be the place where the crime court is or whatever. As you walk in, you think you're entering a public arena. But it's almost like there's a couple of guys going, hey, hey you're up here today. And they call you to a little room. And when you go in that room, they start horse trading with you. The judge isn't on his oath. It's all dealt with in a private capacity. And you leave there with some bit of paper. Oh, God. And you walk out the door thinking that, oh, I don't know why the judge didn't understand me or whatever. Right? The reality is they've been operating in a private capacity. There's nothing, there's nothing public about it. And I, <coughs> part of my work is to expose that. And that's what we've done recently with the thing with me, with Bodden and Mac, because the judge, is, won't give, the judge won't give me the files in Hereford County Court. In fact, they won't even lay them in there anymore, and he's got an appointment. And um, I went there with a chap who came over from France to examine his file. And it's very big, it's, it's, it's all over, right? And um, they said, oh, you're an hour late. He said, I've come from France. He said, you know, it's been an hour late. He said, I've, I've arranged an appointment here, and I, I demand to see my file. And he said, well, we'll show you, but not Mr. Taylor. He said, what do you mean? He said, he's a party to the proceedings. No, he isn't. He is. He said, he's my advisor. So, uh, oh, a judge? Has, no, no, judge. That's a CPR. You know, you don't know that your own rules and regulations, do you? No, you're not legally trained. No, we'll just do what, what the rule says. Anyway, we, we ultimately got to examine his file, and he lost £200,000 in this matter. He's been ranked zero to the, the company. And when we got the file, awesome. I told him what was going to happen. He didn't believe, he was an ex um, uh, RAF aircraft engineer. And he fought for his country over in Belfast and over in Fulton, you know, and then he, he started to come to the, some conclusions, but didn't realize just how bad it was. And when we went back after half an hour and they gave us the file, the lady behind the desk, bless her, she said, oh, I, I put a seal on that one because it didn't have one on the machine. And he said, what? You know, he's really angry. He said, I dare you. You've been tampering with court goods. He said, well, you don't get me one as it comes off the machine. So we kept that one, because I knew in my mind, well, we better keep that one for some reason. But, and she went and got one, and of course, the other one didn't have nothing on. But of course, I don't know if you know that, but in the county courts, they actually put, just says the county court now, no matter where you are. Before, it's a Hereford County Court, Worcester County Court. But of course, this one said, just said the county court. Well, of course, that stamp wasn't even manufactured until this year. And of course, his case was in 2012. So we've got two court orders, one with nothing on. They're not even sealed anyway, they're only stamped. But one with nothing on, and one with this year's stamp on. So they're both, you know, which one do you want? They're both fraudulent. <laughs> absolutely, you know, this is where we're going. You know, and unfortunately, the court staff, because they're not legally trained, you know, don't know. And you know, unless they got, want to get barristers at the counters, they're, they're in serious trouble you know, at the moment. Right? So, we'll move on. Again, I don't, I don't do any really speak. Yeah, no problem. Five four two. Five four two. Yes. It's a rule that the courts have to provide the well, records within. This is a request, and I, I can give this to everybody to do if they want to check a court case out. Yeah. So you want a piece of paper? I always say, and I repeat myself a lot. It's so everyone remembers, right? Because I spend hundreds of hours thinking about this shit, so that other people don't act it. Right? It's not because they can't work it out. It's just because you know I, I've got nothing better to do, perhaps. You know? Much to uh, Linda isn't happy about it, but well, I appreciate it. But yeah, okay. But this is the score, right? So what we put on here, and this is what we put on this, right? Request and notice, right? And I'll give everyone a copy and do your own d details. Please provide a copy, print out of all records from the computer database for case number. Now, that fools some of them, and they give you what is called the case man fi uh, file, which is the case management 
which says every in and out of that particular case. Database comes straight, and if you get that, well, you you get the jackpot. Right? And we've had two or three people who've got Paul and Campbell up in Durham, right? Because then you get a huge printout, and it, it comes out like a it comes out like a, 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 a bank statement, and you can sp specify what you want off that bank statement, you know, and, and that, so it's awesome you get that. Do you need to pay for that? No, 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 no. Everything, okay, no. everything I do, don't pay for, right? Okay, because it, ultimately, why should we? We don't pay for justice. They can't charge you for copies. Yeah, but that's another issue. But we'll, we'll talk about it in a second, right? So the request is made in compliance of the statutory rights. Okay, under their rules. Okay, you're a human being, but if they've got rules and regulations, okay, let's apply them to them, right? So CPR five four two. And this is the rule, and this comes out of the White Book. So if you go to um, look under the CPR, you may find that it says something different, but the White Book is actually the, the, the proper interpretation of it. Right? And this is what it says, so you write it. In CPR 542 is supply of documents to parties, including new parties. The documents should be supplied within 48 hours after a written request for them is received. Right. Yeah, you do this, you do this, uh, well, or you go in and you hand it over, you take two copies of this document, and you give them give them both copies and say, can you please receive stamp one and give me back and put the other on my file. What do you do if the court's offices are closed now, we can't get in the door? What, yes, make an appointment to do it, right? Forget the stamp. Forget the stamp. And what we, were, what we were doing many years ago was when we, you know, the commercial lien aspect, something I did, Years, years and years ago, and I did Liam's in the 80s. You know, so I, I, but people, everyone tries to take it to court, you know, take it to court. Well, why do you take these things to court anyway? You, you, you deal with your own problems. If someone owes me some money, I didn't get to court, I'd go around and say to him, pay up, or else I'll come around and capture your goods. I mean, that's, that's the way I look at it. You know? But anyway, so, and this is the, why I'm saying that, is because the next section on this is CPR 541. People who tried to go around to the courts previously and um, with liens and things and say, I'd like to uh, file this or I'd like to rec record this to the courts and they say, oh, well, have you got a case number? Have you got a, a, you know, a, some sort of number? And, and everyone says, well, no, and they bug you off. Well, in the 541, which is on this document as well, states this, supply of documents from the court records, CPR 541, in brackets. Any party to proceedings may be supplied from the records of the court with a copy of any document relating to those proceedings, including documents filed before the claim was commenced. Well, hang on. How can I file documents before the claim was commenced? So all you do is you apply that rule to them, show them that rule, and they will file your documents based on that rule. And, I, and I've done that, right? Okay, so it's, it works, right? And then, obviously, the third one on this is, is this, and this is the killer. County Courts Act 1984, Section 1 2. Every court so held shall be called a county court and shall be a court of record and shall have a seal. Right. So, this is where we got now. It's very, very simple. It's not odd, right? None of this. So, you go in, you ask for your file. You get you give them 48 hours notice based on a simple document. Get them to stamp receipt a copy and give you one back. You give them the 48 hours, no matter what the case is, it might have been six years ago, it doesn't matter. Go in and ask to see the file. When you get that file, and some people might have a case, and I've had people come to me like almost with a removal lorry, you know, with, with paperwork, <laughs> right? Well, well, hideous amount of paperwork. Right, okay, well, let's stop there because let's just examine the court file before we delve into that nonsense. Because when a lawyer sees that lorry come in, he's thinking, oh, God, I'm going to get a retirement home on that. Yeah? <laughs> Let's just go to the court and have a look at your file. And when you see the file, what should be in there? The essential ingredients for making a claim, which any one of us, if we went to make a claim against each other, would have to have. An application or claim form. It would have to have a court seal on it, as stated in the County Courts Act. It would then have to be supported by an affidavit or a statement of truth, and a fee would have to be paid. Quite simple. If those ingredients aren't there, there's never been any proceedings. It doesn't matter what's happened. A judge can rub a stamp all day. You know, it doesn't matter. There's never been any proceedings. 
You can't get a claim against someone if you haven't filled out a claim form, had a court seal put on it, supported it with an affidavit, and then had it paid your fee. You wouldn't get it. So that's so you can kick it out at that point. And this is the point they know we've got them on. They know they know we've got them on that because what they've been doing is all the solicitors in this country. Uh, we're not going to say clerks down there every five minutes with fees and all the rest of it. So they come to some agreement with the court. Well, in the meantime, who's paid the fees? Us. It's come out of the public purse. They're money laundering. So they want terrorism, ultimately, when they're dragging people out of their houses. They've money laundered to start with. So this is where we've got them on that one. Of course, there hasn't been a court seal on it because if you're dealing with solicitors, they're big solicitors companies, you know, with Eversheds and things, total criminal organisations. You know, I mean, you know, really manic in criminal organisations. You get, you don't get a court seal. They give you a stamp, and the stamp is a very little round thing like that, and they'll put it in a place where it might say seal on the document. And of course, if you don't know, you presume. And then presumption is the mother of all efforts, you know what I mean? You, you presume that it's got a seal on it. It hasn't got a seal on it, it's got a stamp on it. But if you're mug enough, you know, you know what, that's what you believe, then get away, that's where they're getting away with it. They're manufacturing our consent. And this is what they're doing. They're manufacturing our consent in all these issues. So we end up, so we then go to the, the eviction situation. And it's very, very simple because I, I think what we'll do tonight, we'll set up a company and we'll call it, and I use this expression, we we'll call ourselves the Grenadier Guards Company, right? And if we did, because there probably isn't one called the Grenadier Guards Company, we could all then claim to be Grenadier Guards Officers, couldn't we? Yeah. Limited. And that's what High Court Enforcement Officers Limited. That's a, yeah, that's exactly. It's, this is what they're doing. And you think they're coming from the court? They aren't. It's private. It's, it's like the bank spending the, the state solicitors' money. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, uh, this, is where, this, this, yeah, this is where you can pick the <coughs> threads of it up from. I don't know if you remember, Wonga, rather than paying, what are we paying all these solicitors for? Like, uh, you know, they know that 9 out of 10 people, when they, as soon as they get a bundle come through the door from a court, they pay up at that point. Right? Every, 9 out of 10 people do. Right? Oh, you're in the court. They pay up, right? So Wonga decided, rather than getting solicitors, they'd make up solicitors' companies and just send out letters anyway. Of course, they got caught out, didn't they? But it gets worse than that because. All of them are doing that. <laughs> they all do it, right? Okay. No more than them pretending they're solicitors. There isn't any solicitors. There isn't even a court case against you. And I wouldn't be telling you this stuff, right? Because everyone does their own work, and there are people who do completely different work to me. And I don't criticise anyone's work because we're all we're all we're all picking at the same chimera. Yeah. We're all we're all trying to take peace out of it, right? No matter what someone's doing, we're all taking. And that's the reason because we're not focused and channeled, and we've not got leaders. They can't pick us off. Yeah, that's right. That's why. And I'm uh, saying that's why. You know, again, I use the uh, Leon process because the Leon process is a shield. Right? That's all it is. It's a shield, right? It's not. And, and I was wrongly, uh, you know, years ago, telling people to go out and do commercial Leons and stuff. And really, truthfully, they're notarial instruments and they're defence mechanisms. But you can kill someone with a shield, man. If I lose my sword, I can batter someone to death with a shield. Yeah. Just as easy, right? But they're defence mechanisms, yeah? So, you know, we've got these tools available to us. And the problem for us has always been they don't take us seriously. Because they never think we're going to get together in groups like this. And, oh, well, you know, so they, they, they steamroller us, right, with the, the statutory mechanism and take no notice common law. If you look on any claim form against you, you'll see... Are there any human rights involved? And they always have ticked no, even though you know, they don't even know what the oh, you're going to be evicted from your house, you know? So, <laughs> so the whole situation is operating in fraud, and they know it. And this is the point, they're either criminals or cowards. And we've got these judges nailed, nailed. They never thought that self-litigants were going to, ever going to wake up. Go and get yourself a lawyer. And the first thing you do with your lawyer is say, what? Do you work for me? Yes. Are you an officer of the court? Yes. Which comes first? He'll say he's an officer of the court. And that's why he can't undermine the court process. Even if he knows the court process is fraudulent. Yeah, well, I mean, surely the, 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 the Wold, I mean, I don't know if you, any of you know who Shirley Wold is. Well, well she's a lady who, uh, a barrister, who some time ago, some years ago, wrote a document about void orders. Well, you all know what void orders is, because you know Kevin, right? Okay, but void orders, yeah? 
and the fact that they avoid ab initio. And it was, it was this woman who gave us this document, really, that <coughs> gave us the information at the time. And of course, she's maybe been, if you look on the Law Society website, they've, she's been disbarred, and she's now a vexatious litigant. She's not allowed to take out any cases anymore. But this is what's going on. You've got the SRA, you're just a criminal cartel, closing down local solicitors' companies who are helping the public, and then stealing their customers. And I, I'm not saying that lightly. I mean, I'll say it for the record, and if they want to rout me about it, it's going to call. I mean, it's not a problem, yeah? If I'm being uh, uh, um, malicious, which I'm not. So, next one, Luke. Where do we go? Where, where do I mean that's the point. Where do we go from here? Yeah? Westminster. Oh. Onwards up well. Yeah, Westminster. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I mean look, I am in Wales, I'm half Welsh myself, right? And this year this year I'm half a tap. <laughs> yeah, not half I, 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 I but I mean this year has been year of the horse and we've been galloping on, haven't we? I mean we are, that's why you guys are here, right? Next year, who knows what next year is? Oh. It's year of the sheep. <laughs> so the sheep will wake up next year, let's hope, right? Let's kick their ass, right? And that's bottom line. But, right, so I'll go on with this little bit here, because I want you guys to understand about the actors and the acting, right? If, I mean, look, I don't suppose anyone watches Coronation Street anymore, but maybe when we, we used to, perhaps in the 80s, if Ken Barlow has killed Deirdre and hid him in a cupboard, nobody knows, right? And all of a sudden, there's some diligent police who decide to go around and arrest him, you know, because, oh, you've seen him on the telly, do it! You know, they're acting, they're acting, and they're all acting, they're all acting outside of their capacity, they don't understand what's going on, that's what's going on with us. So what I did, I, I cornered this judge, Pierce Higgins, who a few of you have been caught me and know, right? Because what he ultimately tried to do, he's a gatekeeper for our area, he's the, the local capo. And unfortunately, this guy is a QC, so he's not like some deputy district ju judge who basically have failed solicitors who get 16 or 19 days a year acting as a judge with a rubber stamp in around. He, you know, he can send people to prison for life, which is worrying. But um, we've caught him right out, okay? So I mean, I've had court cases with him where he's like three barristers versus me in court and all that stuff. So what we've done, I've done some time ago, and, and a couple of people know about it. Um, they won't give me the court orders. Now, you, know, and I'm not, you can all be in this position, because when they know you're able to forensically examine their documentation. They won't give it you, right? But of course, that proves the point. So they wouldn't give me the court orders. So he, he says it, but he won't give it me. So I said, am I supposed to uh, listen to what you say? What you say is gone then. You know, what you've got to give me in a material form, for God's sake. And I've not got it. So what I did back in uh, July, I, I wrote him something. I'll read it. Now, this is to a, a QC judge. What I'm saying to you is, he's an actor. It, if they showed um, Phil Mitchell of, of EastEnders running around with a knife, and you saw him in the street, you wouldn't run away from him, would you? <laughs> he's only acting, right? Same with judges, same with traffic. And so what we've got to do, if they operate outside the boundaries afforded them by their legislation attached to their acting role, we must then address them in their own private capacity. And this is where we've got the power. This is what we, people power, this is what we do. Right? So this clown, clown court judge wouldn't give me the orders, so I went to the court, applied 542, they wouldn't give me anything, that's fine because that means that they're, um, they're complying with my request. They're not complying with my request, which means that I can take an inference from their request. But I mean, I won't go into that. Into that. So this is ultimately the letter I wrote to him, and I got a response. Dear Judge Pierce Higgins, now this is to the uh, a QC. I'm giving you the courtesy of, uh, I'm, I'm giving the courtesy of writing and addressing this to you in your professional acting capacity. However, you will be aware that all actors must at all times operate inside the boundaries afforded them by the legislation attached to their role. Anyone operating outside these boundaries does so at their own peril and are therefore then liable in their own private stroke personal capacity. 
You appear to have acted as a judge in various civil matters concerning Guy Taylor since February 2012. Yet, I have never received any signed or sealed orders to establish any existence, authenticity or evidence of your professional work. You have been asked for and witnessed by members of the public blatantly refusing to provide any material evidence of these alleged orders. However, Hereford County Courts have requested to provide this evidence, have been requested to provide this evidence, but they are unable to provide any orders that have been signed or sealed. Hereford County Court staff have confirmed that no such orders exist in the court file. A jury is entitled to take an inference from this silence or non-response. It is my true and honest belief that no such legitimate signed and sealed orders actually exist. And this being the case, you were therefore acting in a private and personal capacity. We are all equal before the law. Myself and my entire family have suffered and continue to suffer as a result of your actions and those of the criminal solicitor known to you as Michael Horn. Michael Horn has a criminal record. He's in prison with me. And a... <laughs> yeah, so he ain't even a solicitor, right? <laughs> Michael Horn has a criminal record and is falsely claimed to be a solicitor. You are fully aware he has a criminal record for theft and fraud, because I cross-examined him about it in the book. And as an officer of the court, you are aware of the SRA's standard requirements to be enrolled as a solicitor, and that these could never be met by Horn. Your actions have therefore facilitated Horn to continue to commit crimes <coughs> against myself and my family. I now offer you the opportunity to provide me with the evidence of authentic court orders made by yourself while in your professional acting capacity as a judge. Also, all applications and claims, statements of truth, affidavits to accompany any legitimate orders. I just want some, some material forms and paperwork somewhere along the line. If I do not receive evidence of your professional work in the form of authentic signed and sealed orders within seven days, or I will have the right to take an inference that they don't exist. Thanks, Tony Blair. Because remember the right to silence? Well, a jury can take an inference if you remain silent. So thank you, Tony. Nice one, right? Done as a favour, right? <laughs> If you're unable to support these actions in your professional acting role, then you will be held liable in your private personal capacity and addressed as such in all future actions. We have his own address, right? Implied admission, absent response. So, I have the court manager write to me saying, um, the judge has read it and he doesn't feel he needs to respond. So I said, that's fine, great. I'll now talk to him in his private personal capacity of his own address. And since that time, we received this, because of course we've got this thing going on Bond and Manor, I don't know what I mean. Right, Bond and Manor, what they did, they, they uh, a family home for 30 years, I won't go right through it, because I, I presume most people know. Uh, about a hundred, about 70 police and bailiffs took me off the property with a helicopter and took me off, and they then held the property with bailiffs for like about four months, and then I thought, well, okay, let me, <coughs> we ain't gonna go back and seize the place when there's all these bailiffs around. Let's wait till they think they've sold it and then we'll examine all the land registration documents and see, make sure they're all to the prescribed form. Uh, ultimately, when they thought they sold the place, myself and some good people who are in here now, went up there and we recaptured the property. Of course, police went into overdrive. Helicopter, guards everywhere, and I mean, five days later then we got steamed by the police. We weren't waiting for anybody, but they, we got steamed by them. But of course, they, they well, 100 police there, but they, they weren't able so when, they, when they, they come there, it's all filmed of it. In fact, I've got the police's version of it on film, which I've put on the internet, because the police filmed it, but the, but the police Hollywood version of it, you know. They call it Operation Nautical and all that. But anyway, the bottom line is, when they got to the police station, because I'm aware of other cases where people have gone and repossessed their property, I had a, an interior email from a, 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 from a whistleblower from the CPS saying what they need to prove ownership of a property. And really, truthfully, none of us own our properties. They think that they own the properties and that we're just the leaseholders, even if you're on the mortgage. But if they told the public that, nobody paid their mortgage. And of course, our properties were all paid for outright. But anyway, what they require was certain documentation, the, the sale, transfer forms, and all, uh, completion, and all the rest of it. And evidence that I was evicted, and that's really important, because they have to prove you're evicted. And it used to be called you're a tolerated trespasser, right? But it's now changed. It means you're, you're a displaced person. You're a displaced tenant. You're, not, you're still a tenant, you've just been displaced. 
Imagine there's a geezer down the road and we decide to have a party in his house and we all go over there because we're drunk tonight. And we rip him out of his house and we all go in there and party on. He's not, he's still the tenant, even though he's out in the street, yeah? He's just displaced, yeah? So the police themselves had to go to the county court, who won't give me the documents, they had to go to the county court to get the documents. And I've got here a, a, a document from the police because um, I, I placed a thing called an unless order on the court, um, which meant that they had to produce them documents within so many days, otherwise the case was good to take. Anyway, to prove the lawful ownership. Anyway, well, we're not going into all that. So this is the police schedule of non-sensitive, unused material. Right, get this. Right? The relevant material is files held by the county court regarding repossession of Bodner Manor and the eviction of Taylor. The, and the DC, the detective constable says, I have requested viewing of the files which has been denied by Judge Pierce Higgins. So why is he denied? Oh, why would he deny it? Because he hates me. He wanted to hang me. So why would he deny it? Well, he denied it because it's not, they don't exist. Or if he knows that if they, there is anything in there, they will show that he's operated in a private capacity, which means that he is liable in his own personal capacity because they're horse trading with us. You don't go to county court. I mean, ultimately, I'm only dealing with certain issues like bankruptcy and repossessions and stuff. But even in the child cases and stuff, right, they're not legitimate. These guys, they're, they're flakes. Bankruptcy is it? Listen, you can go to the insolvency register and you'll find out that the guy who claims to be a trustee isn't even registered. These are, these are flakes. And they've been getting away with it for so long, nobody questions them. They license themselves. <coughs> Tell you what, I'll give you all the license and we'll start evicting people out in the streets. Yeah? I mean, and that's exactly what we're dealing with. They haven't got no legitimacy whatsoever. So let's get back on point. Huh? There we go. Right, okay. So, of course, everyone's talking about grand juries. Brilliant thing. Right? Brilliant thing. Because ultimately, the grand juries were taken away from us in the 30s, and there are a lot of really clever people on this. Michael Bernicea, um, John Hurst, who's a, a retired police officer, and these people know this stuff inside out, the history and, and all the rest of it, right? Far better than I do. But that's what we need. We need grand juries. I mean, and I don't know if anyone's aware of what grand juries really and truly are there for. They're, if Al Capone was running around in the 1920s, and he's got the mayor and the police chief in his pocket, and he decides to get a business part of someone who's, who's in business against him out of the game and gets him set up. He's able to say, well, the whole judiciary is corrupt and take it, it to the grand jury who can, who can boot it out or, or they can put the charge in. You know? I mean, it's basically redress from the public. And of course, so, so grand juries are the thing. We've had a problem because polling a grand jury is, is and I was talking to Jamie about this earlier, is awkward because it, if we all decided to be a grand jury, they say, oh, well, you're all biased, yeah? So, but there is remedy inside their own system, because they're all so private and corporate. We do know that the taxation team inside the courts actually uh, are there for, for uh, pooling the jury. And so we could probably get them to do their hang themselves. They always say, if you give a capitalist, if you give a, a capitalist will sell you an, uh, enough rope to hang him with. And, and I think that's probably the case. We can use their system to hang them, the same as we are with all the, the statutory stuff. So, I mean, what I'm saying now is it's like strength in numbers, right? And numbers is the thing, because they never thought we were able to enforce stuff. You know, and at the end of the day, people have held things close to their chest, you know, or oh, I've been made bankrupt, or oh, they've taken my house because I wasn't able to pay, or whatever, right? And people kept all their private problems to themselves. Of course, we've got the internet, wonderful. So we're all as clever as each other. We can all put, pool our information. We can all share our information. And we can all come together in numbers, like you have here now. Brilliant. There's nothing they're more frightened of than numbers. Back in the 90s, I used to do raid parties, you know, um, um, back in my previous life. And I knew that, you know, we used to keep, we used to use, um, uh, not mobile phones in those days, um, uh, pagers. pagers, you know. And we'd say, oh, there's a party in Port Talbot, but nobody knows where, and everybody's driving around waiting for the party. And then we'd get, we'd get a couple of key people there with the PA and with the, the system, and then bang, we'd tell a few people. And once we had over 50 people there, it wasn't happening. They couldn't remove us. They, we knew they couldn't remove us. And the same thing with evictions. And you think, well, okay, they can go back the next day and kick them out, which they can. But once they know that we're scrutinizing their paperwork and we can show that their paperwork doesn't stand up to scrutiny, we've got them over a barrel. And I, 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 I was going to go, but I'll, I'll just finish on this bit here. 
with the paperwork, they come at you in virtually all instances, which I've got one myself, but a, a forged writ, and it would be a writ 66, and the writ 66 is for possession of the property. Right? And this is what they come in with, and they'll come in with one of these. And you go on Westmore website and get it off yourself, right? And in fact, if you want to go to a Westmore website, what a lot of people probably think is a court seal, is even they even put a stamp on it so you can pretend it's a seal, right? Now, when I was in London recently, the police officer is on the record said to me at Mystery Bricks that their legal services department had said they're not allowed to question court paperwork or paperwork purporting to come from a court. So I pulled this out and I said, well, I'll tell you what, lads, I'm a judge. I'm going to fill that out and I'm going to repossess the building. Yeah, yeah, but you've told us now. I said, yeah, but you're not allowed to question or even purporting court documents, are you? So, but that's, that's where we are. But what they do is they come around with this writ 66. So a writ 66 is this, ultimately. It's all fake anyway, but and it is. But they'll come around with this piece of paper and they'll say, we've been commanded by Queen Elizabeth and all this bullshit, right? And they'll hand that over. Now, the whole idea of that, a writ 66, is they're supposed to knock your door, ask you for the keys, ask you for your consent, and if you say no on your bike, they're supposed to go away, say they wouldn't comply, and get a writ 69, and then come back with assistance. That never happens. But they're not allowed to touch you in the meantime. And of course, that's what happened to me in Bob Manor. They came up with a fake one. They carried me off the premises, and that's why I went to court and was able to get the guy charged with assault on me, because he'd, come, because he'd used a fraudulent bit of paper, and it wasn't even the right bit of paper anyway. So, but the way to look at it is this. If you don't comply with some court order, well, it's simple, isn't it? They just go to the court and say, you're in contempt. And of course, they don't do that because they end the court. It's just some private business meeting that's been going on. And they've been shuffling around and sold your 300 grand eggs for 80 grand to one of their mates. And the judge has put a, put a brown envelope in his pocket. And trust me, it's that bad. It is that bad. I mean, I'll tell you what. I, Every day I get more and more amazed. I'm surprised my eyes aren't out there on stalks, right? And I, if anyone goes to court, this is the classic one to take, right? And this is what, when we, when we did the judge arresting in Burke and Edgers go, this is what it's all about. Because I said, because yeah, we knew what was going on, and I said to Roger, read that out and I'll arrest the guy. I'll arrest the client, right? And, and this is what you've got to get, all of you, right? If you go into court, say, for and on the record, and it's Lord Diplock's ruling. It comes from Archbold, so it comes from the Criminal Pleadings and Evidence book. And it's Lord Diplock says this about contempt of court. Now imagine if it was a court. We know it's not a court. But if they're pretending it's a court, then we have to hold it to these standards. The due administration of justice requires first that all citizens should have unhindered access to the constitutionally established courts of criminal or civil jurisdiction for the determination of disputes as to their legal rights and liabilities. Fair enough. Secondly, that they should be able to rely upon obtaining in the courts the arbitrament of a tribunal which is free from bias right, against any party and whose decision will be based upon those facts only that have been proved in evidence adduced before it in accordance with the procedures adopted in clause of law. But if you're going in against the bank, there won't be a witness. It will just be a, a paper exercise. Right? And thirdly, that once the dispute has been submitted to a court of law, they should be able to rely upon there being no usurpation by any other person of the function of the court to decide according to law. Conduct which is calculated to prejudice any of these requirements or to undermine public confidence that they will be observed is contempt of court. Because the whole civil process operates on public confidence. We know it's not law. We haven't armed, injured, or caused anyone any loss. We haven't defrauded any contract. But we've got a load of rules. It, it ain't sensible to drive down the road under all that. But it ain't against the law, unless you're not someone over it. It ain't against the law. So we make rules and regulations. But they can't be usurped, and the public must have confidence in those rules. So they must be to the prescribed form. That's why we pay lawyers £400 an hour or whatever, to make sure the T's across the I's are dotted and everything's correct. So if us stupid litigants out here can pull apart their laws, and show there's been no process, no procedure. What are we paying for? What are we paying these clowns for? You know, and, that, you know, and that's where we are, Bill. So what I'm saying to you now, okay, I've done my bit. 
numbers is the thing, right? Passing the word around. Everybody, right? It's so simple now. We're getting to the, to the heart of this matter. Years ago, it was very complex. And, oh, they're coming up with statutes and acts. And, and, and working out what a legal fiction was, you know, that the fact that we were, when we were born, we were given a, a corporate identity, which that was all complex. All that's easy now. We now, in numbers, are like, you guys are, this is brilliant. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful that you guys are here. We pass the word around, we stop anything that's unlawful with boots on the ground. You've got lawful excuse to do what you want, right, okay? You can kill someone if you've got lawful excuse. You murdered someone, you killed, no, I didn't murder him, I killed him. Why did you kill him? Because he was, he was strangling a child. You've got lawful excuse. You've got, you got lawful excuse for anything. Never mind council tax or parking fines. You're law and these, these people have been, have been parasiting off us for long enough, right? And, the, and it's all over, it ain't happening no more. Next year is year of the sheep, but we're gonna have them. Right? So, <laughs> let's examine your paperwork then. Let's make sure it's correct to the prescribed form. Because the whole thing about statute law, it has to be to a prescribed form. And that's where they come unstuck, because they're lazy. They don't do their jobs. They don't cross the T's, they don't dot the I's. So we've got them, you know, we've got them nailed on that, yeah? Now we've had this thing going on, I mean, we've picked specifically on, we've just got feedback or is it? Okay, we, we, we picked specifically on evictions, because it's terrorism. You know, let's get absolutely right. They might know about, say, say some soldier gets killed in the street today by some terrorist, right? Well, what about the people getting kicked out of their homes with their kids and, and, and all that? Uh, surely, yeah? On fraudulent documentation, that's terrorism. You know, let's get it absolutely right. What is terrorism? So that's why a few weeks ago, myself and uh, Mark Salon and um, Mr. Ebert and that rang the rang MI5, you know, and, and put it to them and uh, said, I don't know who's seen or hasn't seen that, MI5 aren't interested in terrorism. They're, they're the paedophile protection squad, as far as I can see. And I'm absolutely <laughs> But they, they advised us to go to the police, so we all of us got in a minibus. And of course, we were at the local golf club. We were from all over Britain. And we went down to the local police station, which I'm sure Mark Sloan will release a film of, because we filmed and recorded everything. We were transparent, didn't we? We ain't got nothing to hide. And we all went down to the police station. So when the minibus pulled up, I went to the counter, and of course, a big crowd of people came in with me, and I said, we've been sent down here by MI5. <laughs> <laughs> which we had. So. Uh, they all start running around like endless chickens, and um, we got two really good coppers took us into a room. One was a detective constable, one was a PC, and uh, we said, "Look, we got fraudulent documents. We got this, we got that," and we went, and they were really good, and they didn't know they were being recorded and filmed. And we went through it with them for five hours, but we went through it knowing that ultimately, someone farther up the food chain, you know, some uh, chief inspector with a shiny baton, you know, and a little cap is uh, some mason or whatever is going to pull the plug on it. But we went through the process. And that's the point, going through the process, going through the protocol. Yeah, going through the protocols. That's, that's the point, yeah? So, what's been happening in the last few months, which has changed things dramatically, is the response. And we've got Francis here from Response down here. And uh, AD and that from the Midlands set up the response, and of course, guys like Francis have, can, have done it down here. And it's awesome because it means that we're we're able to get a group of people to stop an eviction anywhere in the UK. Really, I mean, in some areas we're in light, yeah. In some areas we're heavy, but we're able to do that. And the thing is, with the boots on the ground, it's it's a common law action. So the fact that you, they're not physically able to enforce their statutory mechanism, that they have to go away. And when they go away, what they do is they have to do a risk assessment. Because when they came there, they were there expecting to take possession of a property, which they, a hundred people end up turning up, they can't do it. So they have to go and take a risk assessment. So great, we stop it on that day, but ultimately, Six o'clock in the morning the next day they can come back and crash their way through. Still with fraudulent paperwork. But that's the whole idea of what we're doing. We're stopping it physically and then we're examining their paperwork and scrutinizing their paperwork to make sure it's to the prescribed form. Because 
abuse of the statutory process is a common law offence. So that's that's really the key of all this. And it took me years to get my head around that simple statement, right, which, which I come out with. But it really is a powerful tool. Because I'm just going to introduce Hugh Bush, if you know who he is. A guy that's been uh, a great help to me and a great help to the group and the Justice on the Lewis campaign. We have the legend who is the one and only Guy Taylor. <laughs> Well, how do I uh, follow that? Right. Um, listen, this is getting easier for me, right? I've been doing this for many years, and it's getting easier. And seeing you guys here now, it's, just, it's amazing. Because the reason it's getting easier is because more and more people are waking up. And I don't have to start this by saying, guess what, you know, do you know what common law is? You, you, you've all, we all know why you were here, don't we? Yeah? yeah? We all know why we're here. Yeah? So hopefully I can give you a little bit more insight to to what's going on, um, and, and we'll go through what's going on, but, you know, applaud yourselves, because, I mean, the fact that I'm down here in Port Talbot with you, with you guys here, awesome. You know, three years ago, everyone had me with a tinfoil hat on, you know what I mean? And, and everyone's waking up, and, you know, it's awesome that you guys are here, so uh, applaud, applaud yourselves, please, right? <laughs> Obviously, what, you know, what, what's been going on over the years is that a lot of us, we're, we're taught, we're still on the shoulders of giants, right? And we, we, we're taught about common law, and common law is completely different to statute law. And so um, we, we understood that, you know, these guys are doing something wrong. And you know, it's morally wrong if people are evicting you, or, or you know, never mind constitutionally wrong, but we had no redress because they kept coming up with statute law and we, we didn't know what was going on. Now, you know, we've started investigating their paperwork because ultimately they're coming at us. So we know it's morally wrong. We know it's constitutionally wrong. But okay, whereas they're enforcing games rules and a mechanism upon us. So all the T's must be crossed. The I's must be dotted. That's why they're paid hundreds of pounds an hour, solicitors, to cross the T's and dot the I's. And of course, when you you'll always find abuse of process, right? And because they've been, they went, to, they went to university and they thought to themselves, well, I've done my, my, my bit. I'll put, me, I'll put me law books up on the shelf. Don't need to bother them anymore. I've got a rubber stamping clown called a judge in the court. He's going to rubber stamp away all day and job's done. And this is what's going on. And, and the deeper you go down the rabbit hole, the worse and worse it gets. I mean, uh, I, I'll just say this as an offshoot. I heard the other day of someone who went to Burger King up in Manchester and they got stitched up with a couple of packets of chips. So what they did, rather than go back to Burger King, they checked out the VAT receipt number and found out that they weren't Burger King at all. There was some offshore company operating from the, the Virgin Islands. So I mean, the, where does this all go? You know, I mean, it, it, it's beyond. So anyway, right. So what, you know, Linda is the puppet master, so I'm just here, you know, with the strings attached. What I want to tell you about is, is basically, I've said about response, I've said about CPS, they're the Crown Prosecution Service, or, or the Corporation Protection Service. Because what actually happens, I take out private criminal prosecutions against these people. Yeah, there. Is that better? Yeah. Can you all hear that? Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, they, it's just one little thing to spell me, right? So I, I take private criminal prosecutions out against uh, these characters. Because ultimately, if they're coming around to you, like um, bailiffs or whatever, they have to have a statutory instrument. And it has to be to the prescribed form. If it isn't, then obviously everything they do is unlawful. Because they're actors, and they're acting in their acting capacity. And if you're acting in your acting capacity, you have to operate inside the boundaries afforded you by the legislation attached to that role. So, in simple terms, it just means you can't step outside the box. If you do, you can never be, you can never, they can never legislate for someone to break the law. And they can never indemnify someone, insure someone to break the law. So if they, they operate inside the boundaries afforded them by, by the legislation, fine, but most of them don't. And it's very, very easy to, 
to pull them apart. Because what's happened over a period, long period of time is there's developed a culture, and like I've said, where the solicitors have been to university and they, uh, they don't need to put their books down, you know, they know what goes on in there and all that the way it is. Standard procedure. When you hear a standard procedure, you know you've got them. Because <laughs> standard procedure, it ain't prescribed form. And I, I, I use a simple analogy. If a couple of us went to work in a factory with all you guys in there, and the boss told me and Linda to do a job a certain way, and we started doing a job a certain way, and then after a bit of time, you lot all come over and goes, what are you two doing? You're going to get us in a lot of trouble. Don't do that. Do this. We start doing the way you say, what the shop floor say. And very soon, we're training people to do the same thing. And that's the culture, and that's what's been going on. And, and it, it's easy to expose, because luckily, we've got redress to the culture at every stage, under their own rules, under their own civil procedure rules, if we're dealing inside the county court, which I'll explain to you. Right. <coughs> Yeah. Do I need it? I'm lagging that one. Right, so act, actors and, and acting, right? Okay, so you've got actors and acting. This is what we've got on every case, right? Okay, you've got a traffic warden.